It's related to the 4W selection. So 4W, uh, most of you have seen the form on the course website and have signed up for your 4W stream. Just a note on that, I, we need to split the class roughly into three equal groupings, so there's no guarantee you'll get the selection that you've selected as your first choice. Um, that's why there's a second choice. The other issue is um, I'm not responsible for 4W. So I, people have been asking me for information about the three streams. I can't give that to you. That's the 4W responsibility. Sorry, the instructors of 4W, that's their responsibility. Dwight Howling was here in the class and gave you a bit of a talk. But unfortunately, the other two instructors have not done that. And so the best option I can suggest to you is to find out from prior years what they've done. Now, I know that obviously the people that graduate from 4W leave, but there is a bit of uh, graduate students who've taken those various streams that are still around. The TAs, for example, have taken some of those courses. So please, um, please find out from others. The process system stream is offered by Dr. Vlad Mihalik, who gave a little bit of a talk here in the class. And then the um, polymer stream is offered by George Lieberman uh, and Marco Saban, but they're uh, two former employees of, or two current employees of Xerox Corporation. Sorry, Marco is current, George is a former employee of Xerox. So they're, uh, they're coming with that practical knowledge. Vlad has about 20, 30 years of practical knowledge in the process system stream. So that just gives you an option uh, for, the, for those areas. The other important point is if you've made your selection and want to change your mind, you're welcome to do that as many times as you'd like. Whatever your last submission is on the course website is the one that we will take. Okay, so if you, if you would like to switch to different grouping or change your alternatives, priorities around, feel free to do so. Okay, any questions on that? Um, that is due by four o'clock today. And if you know of someone who's taking 4W that's not in 4N um, and may not have seen the website, please let them know. Okay, so um, I do need to make that split this afternoon and give that to the administrators so that they can start forming the classes. So at four o'clock today. Okay, let's, um, let's move then to this uh, section of pr process troubleshooting. I, I gave the tutorial on this intentionally before we actually looked at the topic, right? So why out of order? Well, I wanted you to experience troubleshooting in a simulated environment as close as we could possibly simulate troubleshooting in a safe manner in a university setting. We don't have equipment. We can't really go and create problems artificially in a safe manner. And so that simulation that you ran in Thursday and Friday's class is the, our best and closest approximation to it. Um, as far as I know, we're the only university in the world that does that sort of um, simulation. Now, we, we do that so that you experience all the emotions of troubleshooting. We do that so that you experience a fairly ad hoc procedure for troubleshooting. You just used your own process for troubleshooting, which is probably what all the colleagues you'll work with that don't come and graduate from McMaster, they'll also just be using their own method for troubleshooting. And it's not that their methods are wrong or that the method that you applied in Thursday and Friday's tutorial is wrong. It's just perhaps not formalized or not following a process. And our goal over the next two classes is to learn a process that does work. Um, Dr. Woods has developed it over many years and a lot of research has gone into it. So it is something that you can learn, right? Let me give you an example. How many of you have watched TV documentaries or uh, movies of an air traffic controller. Right? So you know what the role of an air traffic controller is, is to avoid aircraft collisions in the air and a different set of air traffic controllers have the same responsibility for on, on the ground as planes are moving around at an airport. But air traffic controllers that take care of the aircraft traffic in the air, they have a 3D view of what's going on up there without actually seeing it, right? So they're sitting in front of a computer screen in a dark room. They don't see anything outside. They just have this mental image of 16, 20 aircraft that they're responsible for and coordinating their approaches and ascents. Now, if you've watched any of those documentaries, they'll typically show you a case of when there's a near miss. Like, so what happens when two aircraft come very close to each other? And if you observe those air traffic controllers' behavior, you will see it's incredibly calm. They have to project a voice of calm to the 
to the aircraft pilots that they're telling instructions to. You'll see that they're dealing with sensors and equipment that are faulty sometimes, that are not giving them precise information. But they have been trained for several years to do that job well. Okay? And so it is possible to learn to troubleshoot. I will post a video link of an interview with an air traffic controller. And the, in the most interesting part is her response after her near miss. She doesn't miss a beat. She just goes right on and controlling the 16 other aircraft despite the near miss that she had. She does admit that she came out of her break, uh, out of her shift 20 minutes later and went on stress leave for a week just to like, get over the idea that she potentially um, could have killed four or 500 people. But that is the, that's her role, right, is to be calm, to manage your emotions, okay? So we're going to learn a systematic technique that works to do that. And it's not that you won't have to do this. I, I'm pretty sure every one of you will have to troubleshoot in some form. Whether you become a, a plant designer, you have to consider troubleshooting for the people that you hand off your design to. They have to go and operate that plant later on. Have you given them enough sensors, valves? Basically, remember the idea we said in class, a heat exchanger can't tell you that it's fouled. Right? The plant doesn't have a voice. So the only way you can give a voice to your design is by adding the necessary sensors to the process that can inform the operators what's going on and inform the engineers. So when you design a plant, you have to understand what troubleshooting is. If you're going into operations, right, so the vast majority of you will go and operate and be responsible for chemical plants or some sort of manufacturing, that's pretty much most of your role. Right? Everyone I've spoken to of my colleagues that work in that area, they say about 80 to 90% of their day is troubleshooting. And you'll see how uh, we, what we've taught you over the past four or five years here at Mac leads into that successfully. Um, if you plan to become a consultant or a managerial role, no one comes up to you and say, says, hey, my plant is operating fine, uh, would you come over? Right? A consultant is only called when there's trouble. And so... You have to be there when something is wrong and understand how to apply these principles. Okay? And lastly, you can make some money out of this if um, you see that this is actually a skill that is useful and not many people have and can do it well. It's a profitable, not profit that like money in your pocket as an independent consultant, but profitable as keeping you employed or keeping you in a company or being able to get promoted. Okay, now... The reason why troubleshooting, you might say, well, if so many engineers work in troubleshooting, why are you only giving us two lectures and one or two tutorials on this? Right? We're graduating here with no, none of this experience. Aren't you doing us a disservice? Well, we are to some extent, but we're, we're trying not to. But the other reason why we're not doing you an entirely a total disservice is that everything you've learned in prior courses, so think back to heat transfer, process control, thermodynamics, Right? Every one of those courses sets up their problems in the following way. Given information about flow, temperature, feed, concentration, determine the volume for the reactor. Right? So they, they give you a number of variables, you calculate one or more other variables. Okay? So that's every other course seems to do that. When we're troubleshooting, we're taking that idea and we're, we're flipping it in a different way. Right? If you were troubleshooting, one way of looking at it is that you might be answering this question. Given these sets of conditions in the reactor, with some uncertainty, so the temperature isn't a fixed number, it's got some range. The concentration has some range. Given that uncertain set of conditions, are the measured values that you see here likely? Could that be possible? Right? In other words, you're doing a sanity check. Are my sensors really telling me the truth here? What's going on? You will see this in the future. You might graduate. And you see this sort of piping, and you've got a flow meter here. Let's call that F4, F5, F6. Right? And flow, flow moves very quickly. So whatever you're measuring here at F4, 5, and 6 is pretty much a, a mass balance. You'll see something like um, F4 is equal to F5 plus F6. Obviously, we've we learned that early. But you'll see something like that sense is reading 100. That sensor is reading 40, and that sensor is reading 50. 
Right? You will see this. What's, like, how do you reconcile this? Right? And then the, a minute later, you might see this is 104, and that's 45, and that's 60. Right? And then another minute later, those numbers will change around a bit. But you can get data that does this. Okay? Are you, which sensor is in error? Is it one of them that's in error? Are all of them roughly in, in error? And so that equation is actually fairly accurate. Right? So we're going to have to learn to deal with this. And, and that comes from intrinsic experience with the process. And that's what this question is answering here. Another question is, is the flow, I'm sorry, if the flow of coolant stops or slows down, to a reactor, what would be the effect on the measured variables? So we've learned about reactor design and we've learned about process control. You combine those two together, you will know then that when you reduce flow to a reactor that's got a control loop on it, you know what the anticipated measured variables should be doing after that point in time. Right? That's why we've learned 3E, Tom Adams' uh, dynamics course, and numerical modeling. That's why we learned 3P and 3K. All of those three get combined to answer that sort of problem. What are the conditions in the reactor that would cause a rapid increase or a gradual, sorry, a rapid decrease or a gradual decrease in the conversion? Right? So process control, chemistry, and process dynamics, again, in that sort of question. So it's not that we haven't taught you these things. These are troubleshooting objectives. It's not that we haven't taught you these. We've taught you these in several courses. And Dr. Schwartz, when he's teaching 3P, or Prashant, when he's teaching 3K, they don't teach that course for troubleshooting. They're teaching that course for the purpose that they're teaching it, right? And that's what their goal should be. But what we're doing here in 4N and 4W as well will start to make you think about bringing these ideas together. And how these courses interact. So this course requires that sort of level of skill. Okay, so again, in the future, you might get a flow sheet like this. There's a, there's a tank, there's a pump, a heat exchanger, a flash vessel, a bit of a recycle. And we're say, seeing that the yield of the product has decreased by 10%. Fix the problem is the emergency that your boss places on you. And then now you're like, well, where do I start? Right? And this is what you were doing in Thursday and Friday. You were just guessing. In most cases, I was just hearing guesses. Like, I think this is wrong. I think that's wrong. Tell me what this temperature is. I think it's this, right? Reactors are not well mixed. Pumps are breaking, right? We, we've got to start to think about not the regular steady state operation that you learned about, but transient changes to the process. Okay, and that's, that's what our goal is here, is how do we deal with that sort of uncertainty? Okay, and as up, up here, the slides are, are on the course website. You can print them out, but if you don't have them today with you in front, in front of you, that's not, not too bad. It's, um, I've given you a handout. But essentially, what we're hoping to convince you of is we can learn about troubleshooting. There is a systematic approach you can follow, and you're going to use all these principles that you've learned about in, uh, in bringing that together. Okay. So let's... Um, Let's take a look at, at it. If you've got your hand out there in front of you, the first page shows you the six steps. Okay. This looks familiar, right? Those of you that have taken 4M with me, you see this, this sort of process being used. Um, 2G, Emily and Kim, they teach this sort of approach as well. Other instructors in chemical engineering use a troubleshooting or, sorry, a problem solving approach. And these steps that are here, engage, define the problem, explore it, diagnose, implement, and look back or reflect or generalize, as it's sometimes called, these are one of the methods you can use to troubleshoot. Right? And if you go out in your career and you work at the company, then they might have an eight-step procedure. And your colleagues from Waterloo might have a seven-step procedure with slightly different names. Doesn't matter. Okay, it doesn't matter too much. It's not that they're wrong and you're right. What matters is that there's a process that you're following. And you'll see that when you compare any one of these five, six, seven, eight-step procedures for solving problems, 
side by side, there's a lot of duplication. Okay, so we pick one, work with it. If you don't like this one and want to add a seventh step that's a little bit different, feel free to do so. But we're going to work through this uh, approach here. And the key insight, the only reason why I have the slide up is to show you that it's a circular approach. Um, and in fact, it's, it's even a, it's not, it's not possible to draw it. This is a, even a very simplified version of it. It's not that you have to do one, two, three, four, five, six, and then come back to one. If you get stuck at part three, you start back over at one if you need to, right? It, you might uncover new information in part four that leads you to going back to step two. Right? It's very nonlinear. It's not, not that you have to go in sequence. And the only other slide that I'll keep up before we move to stuff on the board and, and working through the handout here is this one, which talks about time criticality. Okay? So if this room is on fire, you don't sit back, okay, let me engage. Let me define the problem. Okay? There's an action that needs to be taken because the critical condition exists. So we, we, we recognize that, right? We're not going to dogmatically follow a six, seven step procedure all the time. But what I do want you to recognize is that if the process is so time critical, your option pretty much is to shut down the process. If that's your determination, that your process is critical and that it's in such a state that you can't fix it, shut it down, okay? And you don't shut it down. The operators shut it down. You never push the red button. The operators always push it. They're the ones that are trained to do so. As much as you're tempted to, and you're sitting behind a control desk, do not do that. Okay? Engineers have been fired for doing that because it's often company policy that those that are most knowledgeable and have trained, been trained to shut the process down do so. We don't go and override that. So they shut the process down, or you can determine that the process can be saved in some way, not go to a total shutdown, but move the process to a point which reduces the problem and gives you breathing room to troubleshoot, but doesn't shut down. Right? Shutdown is so expensive, you don't, you don't ever want to do it. Right? The, be the worst problems happen when you shut the process down and when you start it back up again. Plus, all that time that you're down, you're not making any money whatsoever. Right? So this is an extreme, extreme route to be taking. What you typically want to take is one of these two routes. Either you've got the, the time to troubleshoot and implement your solution that you're going to come up with, or you can move the process to an intermediate point where you're not producing great product. I mean, you might not even be producing product that you can sell to your customer, but you're not shutting down heat exchangers. You're not shutting down furnaces. Okay? You're going to a lower flow rate. You're going to conditions that are safe to operate at, that give you, buy you a bit more time to then troubleshoot and then implement your solution. Okay, so that's what that's about. Okay, so let's work through a case study. I'm going to work through the six steps with you. We'll only get to steps one, two, three, and maybe even four today. Okay, because we're going to go through this deliberately slowly. So flip through the pages you have in front of you, the handouts. Page two is a description of the problem, and page three is this flow sheet that's up here. Okay, so I'll give you a few minutes, or a minute or two, to read the problem statements. And tear the sheets apart and hold the problem statement side by side with the flow sheet so you can see what, what we're diagnosing.
Okay, so let's work through this six-step approach. Let's, um, when we talk about the engage step, the engage step is a step where you manage your emotions. It's that feeling that you got in the tutorial on Thursday or Friday where you're reading this and you're like, what the hell do I do now? Okay, it's, that, it's a bit of a sinking feeling. No different to when you start an exam and you look at these questions and you're like, what the hell? Okay, that is the, that's the feeling. Managing those emotions and getting beyond that is the part which it, what successful people do, right? If someone who succeeds is they are controlling those emotions, they're engaging with the problem, they're not throwing their hands up in the air, they're not running away from the process, they're like, let's just get the hell out of here, I'm quitting. Okay, people that are successful engage with this. There's, Dr. Woods puts in an expression, I want to and I can. Okay, you can do this, We've, you've got the skills, you're confident. You, oh, sorry, you've got the skills, you might not be confident, but you do have the skills, right? You haven't made it to this class by failing all your courses and not knowing your stuff. So you do know your stuff, you just might not be able to put it together. Right? And that's the confidence we need to build, is being able to say, let me take my 3P knowledge, my reactor design knowledge, my fluid flow knowledge, and solve this problem. Okay? So know that you're confident, that you can do this, you're not going to run away. And here's some advice. When you're a boss one day, and you're responsible for your engineers doing this, it's unhelpful to say to them, go do something now. Why are you just standing there? Right? You're adding more urgency onto a problem that's really not needing it. Okay? One of the best things you can do is give them the room to work through, this, through a process, but follow a systematic process. Right? Give them the guidance. You've, by the time that you're a manager, you would have gone through troubleshooting multiple problems. So learn from your experience and train your engineers to help them. But don't just say, why are you standing there? Right? Like, go to the control panel and just start pushing buttons and closing valves and turning off fuel. Right? That's unhelpful as well. Okay? Don't just um, don't feel that you need to be doing something for the sake of it. Okay? And also, don't blame others. Don't go around saying, well, the operator shouldn't have done that. That's not, that's not helpful either, right? We can, we can go after the fact and see, okay, what might we have learned from this? What could we have changed to prevent the operators from doing that? But blaming other people, running away, and adding more pressure to the situation are three unhelpful features, okay? They're the opposite of engage. Engage is like, let's solve this, we can do it. So the next step is to define the problem. Well, let's take a look at this a little bit, right? You've read, you've read the description there. And the defined step goes as follows. Let's put the board up. Right? We don't need this anymore. Keep it in front of you. I don't need to show it here. Okay, so we're now in the defined step. And the defined step, I'd like you to answer these questions based on what you have in front of you. What should be happening? Okay. So you're going to talk about this with the person next to you. What should be happening? What is actually happening? Okay, and answer the question, I would like to have, okay, so I'll give you two minutes to talk with the person next to you and answer those three questions. This is what we ask in the define stage. Lots of discussion, please. We really need to be engaged with this process.
Okay, let's hear some ideas. What should be happening? Is it? Ga sorry, f gas flow should be should be going up. Okay. As the fuel flow increases, so fuel flow increases, the temperature should be going up. Other thoughts, Adam? Okay. We don't see, okay, so at the first step. Okay, so this is, there's, a, there's one, we're operating at steady state, then some change is made, then another change is made. Okay, so when we look at this, uh, I'm going to be actually looking at what should be happening, what is actually happening. We're at steady state, we've increased the feed flow rate. The fuel flow goes up. Does that make sense? Temperature stays constant. Joseph? Why would the fuel increase if your system is wrong? Like if, if it was reading it wrong, then the fuel wouldn't go up at all. Okay, so that's, that, that, there's the issue. So here we're being controlled. We're controlling temperature, so notice the control loop on TC1 joined to the feed flow, the fuel flow F2. Right, so if we're increasing the feed flow, we need more fuel to keep temperature constant. That makes sense. Okay, what's what? So that's what should be happening, right? So what should be happening is fuel flow increases. But um, TC1 should be constant. Okay, that's, that's process control over there for you. We're using that control loop TC1 to F2. To maintain the temperature one constant. Everyone clear on what should be happening? Does it make sense back there? Yeah. So let's take a look now at this, this last third of the plot. We're seeing feed increase another time, right? And that makes sense. We're being asked to operate at higher throughput. We want to sell more product. So we need to put more feed through the system. And as we put more feed through the system, we saw in the past that fuel flow increases. And now we're seeing fuel flow increase. The temperature is dropping. Okay, so what is actually happening is what I just described over there. So when we say what is actually happening, we look for look for trends in the data. Okay, and here we're seeing temperature dropping drastically. Dropping despite increased fuel. Okay, so that's what's actually happening. This is what you're verbally saying aloud in those troubleshooting tutorials. Right? You're describing simple factual information of what you're seeing here. So what would we like to have? We would like temperature TC1 to stay the same and fuel to reach some steady set point. So TC1 to stay the same and fuel to reach new set point. Or let's say a steady set point. Okay, so what we've done is we've, we've specified what, what is going on, what we would like to happen, and where we would like to end up, right? So those of you that drive a vehicle and winter time, the biggest thing is obviously skidding and sliding on the road. And the advice you may have learned when you learned how to drive is that if you have to brake suddenly on a slippery surface, you aim for where you want to end up, right? You aim for somewhere further down the highway 
and that's what you go for. You don't try and maneuver and skid around. You aim for a, s a certain goal. It's the same idea here. Know where you'd like to end up from this problem. Right? And the only way you can do that is to see what is the deviation from where you'd like to be so that you can try and aim for that end goal. Okay? So that's what we verbally talk about. And you're doing this in a heartbeat in your mind as an engineer on a process you know. Okay, so this doesn't take very long. You certainly don't go sit and write this out like that. Um, this is something that you're almost instinctively doing in no time. So when we look at the six-step approach, the biggest concern people have is, I don't, have, I don't have time for this. I've got five minutes to solve the problem, right? Well, a lot of this you're doing instinctively and very quickly. And what we're just looking here is breaking it down and seeing those steps. So what else do we need to do? Well, you'd like to solve that problem. Let's look at moving on then to the next step, exploring issues around it. So when we look at the explore step, and this is the step that people are most tempted to skip over. When we look at a problem-solving approach, people will always go from engaging, perhaps defining the problem, and then just going right in and solving it. But when we look at explore, this is the part where you have to sit back a little bit more thoughtfully and see what you're, what's doing, what's going on here. And the first step you do is you look at the fundamentals. Okay? This is where you have to see and ask yourself, what do I know applies in this system? Well, are you going to use mass and energy balances? Yeah. Definitely. Okay, you've got fuel flow increasing. Sorry, feed flow increasing. You've got fuel flow increasing. This material is changing. It's got to go somewhere. Mass and energy balances have to be obeyed. Right? We, we drill that into you from second year, third year, fourth year, all the time. We know that mass and energy balances must be obeyed. So look at, look at those. Any chemistry apply here? Okay, we're combusting. Chemistry does apply. There's heat being released. Heat transfer. Absolutely. We've got radiation heat transfer from that flame, and then we've got convective heat transfer in the top part of the fired heater. If you look at the coils right at the top of the fired heater just leaving, we're, um, we're heating our stream in that way and then using the radiation of the flame. Fluid flow, thermo, process control, Reaction kinetics, we've got a pack bed reactor. It's a little bit downstream of where the problem seems to be. But reactor design, reaction kinetics might have played a role in that particular instance. So when we look at our fundamentals, we go back, think of all the courses you've taken. Um, another one, measurements, your 2i course. Pretty much every course will apply except 2G and 4N, right? 4N just brings it all together. 2G is communications. Maybe your lab courses won't apply so much, but every other course you've learned about will bring some aspect to bear to troubleshoot that problem. Right, so ask yourself which one of these apply, which knowledge might I have to go back and look up? And this is where you need the time. Explore step does need time, especially when you're just learning to troubleshoot solve and troubleshoot problems that are not time critical so that you can get a chance to do this exploration. Right? Eventually it becomes automatic. Eventually you've looked at your mass and energy balances, your chemistry, your heat transfer so often that you don't need this time. It just becomes second nature. Okay? Or you get so, you become, like if you go work in petrochemicals, you just become so knowledgeable in the specific area of the flow sheet that you're working with that this you don't even realize that you're doing this. But when you're just starting out, you may have to consciously go and, and figure out which, which books or, or references do you go back to. 
Okay, let's look at a bit at cause and effect for a minute. So this is hard, right? Troubleshooting is hard. The only other people I know that do it really well are doctors. Right? You go to a doctor and you say, this and this and this is wrong with me. Figure out what's going on. Right? This is exactly the same. This and this and this is wrong. Figure out what's going on. Right? We're asking you to be a doctor in two lectures. Right? It's not that we can't do that, but it's, if you look at, when, if you go over to the med school, we train them to do this over many years. They have fake patients coming in pretending that they've got symptoms. I can't bring in a chemical plant here for you, unfortunately, and do the same. But back in the med school, that's, they're trained very thoroughly on this troubleshooting process. And it's no surprise that Don Woods uh, did a lot of collaboration back in the 70s with the med school, right, because they've done it really well. So when you're looking at this, you're basically a doctor for a process. That's your role in troubleshooting. We're asking you to become doctors. And what doctors do is they don't do this. Right? That's the easy step. We learn that in all these lovely courses here. You learn the cause and the corresponding effect. Okay. Now we're asking you to do this. We're seeing multiple effects and trying to figure out what the cause is. So let's, let's do that. So temperature is dropping. So temperature TC1 is dropping. What is the normal way that that effect might occur if the feed flow goes up? Okay. If my feed flow goes up, the normal response that I expect, now here I'm going to ask you just to think carefully through this, I'm increasing my feed flow not my fuel, my feed to the process. The normal response is if my feed flow goes up, I'm putting more material through that fired heater, then temperature will drop just before that feedback controller kicks in. Now the feedback controller is going to kick in and then undo that all for me. Right? But just if I didn't have that feedback controller or just before the feedback control takes action, if I increase the feed flow, I will see temperature drop initially. Right, that's the regular cause and effect. Feedback control notice always undoes cause and effect, which is why we teach feedback control last, right? because it, it makes the things work the opposite way around. OK, so if feed flow increases, we might have observed the temperature dropping here for that reason. That might be a true cause and the corresponding effect observed here. OK, but what? We have that feedback controller. So that, let's, let's leave it at that. Let's look at other causes and effects. What might be the effect of um, feed temperature? Which way would feed temperature have to move up or down in order to observe that temperature one dropping? Down, okay? So if my feed came in colder, I might have observed that TC1 dropping. Okay, so that becomes essentially what those two points are there. They become hypotheses. We're hypothesizing now that these could be potential causes because they match up with what we expect as the corresponding effects. Okay. If feed flow goes faster, temperature will drop. If feed temperature drops, we expect the temperature to drop on the outside, leaving the fired heater. Okay, so cause and effect fundamentals. Let's move on to a third possible way that you can explore a process, and that is by checking your information. Now the handout that you have in front of you, the one that's the very, that was the very first page before you ripped it all apart, that has all the stuff I'm covering here in bullet points. Okay? So 
When you're troubleshooting the process this coming Thursday and Friday, you're going to have this next to you as the troubleshooter. And this gives you just a list of things to remember. You, so you don't have to pull out your notes that you're taking now. You've got, got it there to, to remind you. So you'll notice on that list, um, we've looked at what fundamental principles apply. So if you look at the, the first bullet point under section three, what fundamentals apply? What variables are normally important for this fundamental area? We're looking now at the third one. Are the sensors working and are the measurements consistent? Okay, that's what I'm addressing here, checking your information. As Dr. Marlin has said when he taught in the prior lectures, the sensors lie. No sensor ever tells you the truth. It might be close to the truth, like your watch on your arm might be just close to the true time, but it's, it might not be exactly on time. No sensor gives you the exact information. So we need to check, right? we need to verify, ask our process, is the sensor correct? And we're playing here with our fundamentals. Right? This ties in with, the, with this one. Right? Let me give you a few examples. We know that the sum of flow in must equal the sum of flow out. Okay? That's that idea that I drew earlier on where you've got the split in the stream, and I call that F4, F5, F6, that plays on the idea of a mass and energy balance, but we're checking if our sensors are lying. Right? F4 must equal F5 plus F6, and if they don't, one or more of those sensors are not telling the truth. So how can we verify which sensor is not telling the truth or which one is correct? Well, we won't put just one sensor on a critical stream, we will put another sensor if we need to. So we can cross check those two sensors. Okay, and this looks a little bit idealistic, but in practice we actually do this often for free. You don't, no one sits there and puts duplicate sensors on their PNID, but what we often have is that F6 is over here, and then there's a whole lot of other stuff that happens and we have another sensor downstream, there might be a reactor, a tank, and so on, and we measure F7. And these should be mostly consistent. Right? So it's not that you have to look for two sensors exactly next to each other. You might have to go to another page in the PNID on a larger flow sheet to find that corresponding information. Okay. So these flows in must equal flows out. BP Texas City. They were starting up that raffinate tower. There was zero flow out because they were filling up the tower and they had just all the flows in. Right, so someone that had information on the flows in could have seen, and they mentioned that in the video, that there's no flow out. The way they mentioned that in the video is that they said on this screen the operator had no totalizer. A totalizer is a simple device that just calculates the cumulative sum and totals it up. So if, so if they had the totalizer there on their screen, they would have seen the flow in is rising and rising, and the totalizer on the flow out is not rising. Right? So immediately you're like, okay, mass in, mass out. If they don't balance, there's an accumulation. Right? So back to fundamentals here. Okay, we always come back to these fundamentals. So check your information, and that's... One particular option is flows. Another one that you should always check is pressures. Okay, here's the challenge for you. Tonight or this afternoon, go to your PNID for the thalic and hydride, malic and hydride flow sheet you're working with. And look at the pressures on each of the streams. We know from this course here, that fluid doesn't flow by itself. To things, for things to be flowing, there must be a pressure gradient. Something has to drive the stuff through the process. It won't automatically move through it. So you must see higher pressures than lower pressures as you go downstream. Something has to push that material through the flow sheet. right? And so if you're reading a pressure here, Let's call that P4, and here P5, and there might be a vessel in between. P4 
must be greater than P5. There's an immediate way to check your information. Right? If that's the regular direction of flow, P4 must exceed P5. Go look back at your flow sheet. Every one of the pressures makes sense. The stuff moves down through the flow sheet through that way. Okay? Pumps will upset that a little bit because that's the purpose of a pump is then to boost the pressure, and pr but then downstream of that pump again, you'll need a pressure gradient. Another one is temperatures. Okay. If you have a heat exchanger exchanging heat, we know that those four temperatures, if I had measurements on all the four streams, has some sort of consistency. Right? The entry temperature must be higher than the exit temperature for the stream that's being cooled. And conversely, the temperature entering must be lower than the temperature leaving for the stream heat being heated. We, we know that, right? Back to this course here. So that consistency must show up in our data. We know that if that's a counter-current heat exchanger, that there could be a temperature cross. If it's a co-current heat exchanger, those temperatures must obey a relationship between the four temperature values. Okay? So this is all going through your mind during the explore stage. This, on Thursday and Friday when we're doing this back in the tutorial, I want to hear the sort of verbal churning in your brain going through every single one of your courses that might be relevant and checking the data, checking that it's consistent. Okay? So we don't have time to go to step four here. We're almost done the explore step, but what I want you to do is keep the sheet here in front of you over the next day or two, and I want you to think about possible causes. So that's all you have to do is what could possibly be causing this problem? You should be able to come up with a list of at least 10. Okay, it's not a hard, not a hard problem to do. 